There wasn't much of an explanation. After talking to people about the photograph for the last eight years, putting the pieces together, I still haven't figured out the most important of questions. Why? I suppose most things don't go well asking why. From subway train advisories to the birth of the universe, asking these kind of questions is like slamming your own head against the wall. The fact remains that the photograph in blue had many arms, all of them leading to a couple of wrists, then to some palms, splintering into two ten-fingered paths, like a willow hanging, scraping along the dirt. I have charted these vein-like explanations for years now, beleaguered by something unexplainable but familiar, like a mist on my skin, but never knowing where it came from. I'm not talking about death. People die every day. I'm not talking about illness either. People get sick every day. There was more to this fog, these elements that can't be explained, save that they were all part of this one blue photograph. The structures of the chemicals in the development phase, to the processing of the image, to the hands of the developer, even to the building it was made in, they all ended up in flames. The blue photograph was of four musicians in a band, four silhouettes, all frozen in action. All the hues were blue, save for the red amber bursts in strange places. The photograph was taken on a Nikon 60mm lens camera and the small purple letters and ink smeared from my finger on the back of the picture. The blue photograph was taken in 1988 in New York City. It was at the Go-Go Room, which doesn't even exist anymore. Now at the corner of 17th Street and 8th Avenue, there's a parking garage. Solemn tiers of metal supporting BMWs and Escalades piled upon each other like those mausoleums in New Orleans, the dead stacked in slots above the ground. If you walk by the intersection today, it's sad to see the corner conducting its traffic business. This is where the blue photograph was taken inside the go-go room in 1988. Saturn Moon. That was the band's name. If you notice above the lead guitarist's head, there's an odd burst of amber and gold over the blue-black shadows. These were the lights from the truss above his head, but it looked like a halo burst behind him. That guitar player was named Jim Hastings. He was born in Des Moines, Iowa. Over on the left side of the photograph was the singer, Marky e. Sullivan. I could tell who he was because I knew the band. The photograph showed Marky e. with his two lanky arms draped over the stage, locked in some worshipping stance. In the back, behind the gleaming silver drums, was Billy Dixon, a New York native from Queens. Actually, we all knew about Billy Dixon long before he was in the band. It was because of the way his mother had died. She was trying to walk past the scuffle on the 7 train and got pushed out onto the tracks. She died when the train split her in two. Billy Dixon became the face everyone had remembered from the post that week. Tears running down his eight-year-old cheeks, surrounded by photographers. His sister told me his love of the drums sprung from pounding out his rage on him, not hurting anyone in the process. Less tragic was the bass player, Jason Whitman, who held his instrument like a weapon against the black shadows of the audience. Jason and I shared many after-hour drinks once the go-go room closed its doors at 5 a.m. He was a natural comedian, and women were drawn to him in some preternatural way. This is why most of the shadow stalks of arms in the blue photograph reached out toward the center of the stage. I remember that corner in New York. There were wild throngs of young people. Anybody from ragged punks to new wave hippies to the leather-clad bikers and cruising party boys. Everybody drank at the go-go room. It was a regular carnival. In those days, the corner of 17th and 8th was the center of a tornado, a no-man's land. The cops were non-existent until the people started to get hurt. One of the bikers smashed some tourist's head down on 17th Street. On a random Tuesday, someone got shot around the corner, but we didn't know who they were. People overdosed in the bathroom, and we didn't know them either. The photograph looked sewn together the more I stared at it. Little fibers quietly laced, stitch by stitch together. I pushed my finger across the image and the blue and black hues spotted by the red amber diamond explosions. My first theory was that the amber exploded in a pattern, like a diagram connecting these musicians and their futures together. That mighty halo burst over Jim Hastings' head was interesting. The way he slowly turned his cheek to the praying Marky e. Sullivan, it looked like maybe... Just maybe something religious was happening. 
If you look close at the photograph where Marky Sullivan's lanky arms fell to the stage, there were many little specks of red amber at his feet. I used to think that this meant that Jim and Marky had shared a secret, and it was both of their talents that led to numerous records being sold in 1990. But this was just my theory. Everybody knows Bill Dixon left the band soon after the photograph was taken and drank himself to death in Philadelphia in 1993. It wasn't so much the alcohol. That was the polite way of saying he shot large amounts of China White heroin while drinking copious amounts of alcohol in a rooming house in Philadelphia. No one was surprised. His mother was killed on those tracks in Queens, and it was only a matter of time before he was going to find a way to join her. You could tell Marky Sullivan was going to be successful. It was because of my theory about the amber lights. That's how I figured it all out. If you count the small ambers by his hands, the number comes up to 17. Strangely enough, it was on January 7, 2006 that Marky Sullivan was diagnosed with throat cancer. I did the math. January, the first month, added to the seventh day, 17. And the year was 2006. 2 plus 6 equals 8. If you use the principles of simple math and add the 17 together, you have the 8, 1, and 7. He was the singer with throat cancer, and there was no worse irony than that. I didn't even care about numerology at that point. These principles are principles of simple math, and the eights were everywhere. A car hit the owner of the go-go room, and his name was Robert Rosenbaum. The car twisted his spine in an accident on 8th Avenue, but I'm not going to make any connections with that, even if it did happen in August. I gave up that 8th number theory back in 2000. The rest of the band was fine. I mean, as fine as you could get. Jason Whitman got a girl pregnant after the photograph was taken. She demanded they leave the city to raise the kid. When I went to find her in Albany, she told me that Jason's drinking had made him a different man. He left her and their seven-year-old daughter to go out west and even the lawyers couldn't find him. The only thing they could find was his note. It said simply, I'm sorry. The woman was obviously distraught and kept asking me questions about why I tracked her down to find Jason. I explained I was writing a piece for a magazine. Luckily, she didn't ask me which one. I showed her the blue photograph, feeling it brittle and hard in my hands, and then she started shaking. I was there. That was the night I met Jason. At the go-go room, she explained. I felt a cold feeling crawl up my arm. I left, driving back to New York City, keeping my eyes on the little flickering white lines of the freeway so I didn't doze off in the darkness. I heard the photoshop where the blue picture had been processed was burned down to the ground. I told Jim Hastings about it at a coffee shop in the East Village. Jim's face went white as if he was cast in porcelain. What's wrong, I asked. That's so weird, Jim said. The creases in his cheeks looked like they had been dug out with a razor. I just think it's a little strange. You know who took that photograph, don't you, he asked. I shook my head. Dana. Dana Valley. You remember Dana Valley, that rock and roll chick? She was always drinking at the West Side Lounge? No, I said. Jim leaned in. Dana Valley died in a fire in her apartment in the Lower East Side. How did you get a copy of this? I told him I got it from a scrapbook that was laying around the go-go room before they closed. It was a free-for-all of memorabilia that night. Yeah, well, either way, Jim said, slugging a backpack over his shoulder. Dana got burned alive, passed out with a lit cigarette which caught on her curtains. She was so drunk she didn't wake up before she choked to death on the smoke. I questioned him about the backpack he was wearing. Jim Hastings told me he was leaving to Europe for good. He took the last of the money he made from the Saturn Moon records and was trying to start a new life in Berlin. You got quite a thing there, man, he said, leering at the photograph. That shit is bad luck. Well, I don't believe in luck, I said, but I don't think he heard me. I stuffed the photograph back into my pocket and walked briskly to my apartment. Alone sometimes, I still look down at that blue photograph and the smeared date of ink on the back. I trace my fingers between the red amber explosions surrounding the blue-black silhouettes. All the connections to where this photo was taken, where it was developed, and who took it were all gone. The band members, all except Jim Hastings, had disappeared or were dead. I wanted to tell Jim about the glow around his head and the shining red ambers and let him know that maybe that's what saved him. I didn't want to have to worry about it. I should have. It was years later that I heard Jim Hastings was found dead in his loft apartment on June 6, 2012. 
I read about it in the New York Times. Famed 80s band leader, mysterious death in Berlin. They mused about drug rumors. They mused about suicide. I tried not to do the math. The day I read those words, famed 80s band leader's mysterious death in Berlin, I really tried hard not to do the math. I took out the photograph from a hard copy book and stared at the laced fibers of blue and black and those red amber bits of light. I tried not to count anything or start making any kind of connections with the numbers I conceived or the stories that I had heard. I went right to my sink and scratched a match and lit it. Blue flames seared the photograph and all the brittle pieces fell from my hands and circled down into the drain. The date on my phone that night was 11-9-2013. I let the water faucet run just to flush out the silence of the room. I opened up a fresh bottle of whiskey, staring down at the pieces of the photograph and listened to the rain hit my windowsill. I tried to keep my mind from thinking too much. Maybe the alcohol would actually work. This time.